Hello there and you're very welcome along to what is now episode 43 of the Football Pod with Paddy Andrews and James O'Donoghue. How are we doing boys? Magic. All good in the hood. Paddy, I'd say you've been glued, whether it's the iPad on in the corner and work, you've had the player <laughs> on the website or you've had the TV over your shoulder, you've been glued to the World Cup, have you? Or have you not? I haven't seen it off as I would have liked. Uh, I watched yesterday, lad, but what an absolute car crash of an opening game, like. Oh my God. The, Jimmy, you were saying the right was on the wall. We should have known. When Ireland beck at our 4 0, <laughs> we should have known those boys weren't going to be up to much. Jesus Christ. But even watching the end of the Holland match there, there's no one in the stadiums. Like, they can't no. sell the move. Sure, they're, they're, giving, they're, they're giving away free tickets and dressing them up as the teams, like giving them the colours. Oh, it's so farce, isn't it? Jesus Christ. Like, yeah. shambles. Missed England today, though. It's coming home already. I just seen trending on Twitter. Mm. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, it's going to be it, a long month. It looks like it's coming home. It certainly does. Not really. No, they're brutal at the back. No, they're not, they're not going to win it. No chance. If Iran, they could have had three, at least three. Probably could have. Poor old Harry Maguire. <laughs> wow. Harry had a mare. Well, he had a mare defensively. But they were giving the man the match on BBC for getting two headers from corners. <laughs> the beef. Michael Richards. I don't believe anything Michael Richards says. He is the worst pundit. <laughs> Just shambles like. Anyhow, yeah, it'll be keep us going. Uh, cold winter nights to be watching. Yeah. Yeah, yeah from the uh, from the Solus World Cup to Club G A. Like what? What a segue, what, lads. What a segue that was. Yeah. <laughs> there was a couple of empty seats in Crow Park, though, at the weekend. I don't know if I agree with this. Kilmacook Croaks have played in Crow Park, I think, four, will it be five times by the end of the year? This year, they're obviously getting to the latter stages. They're from um, Dublin, though, so they, if they want to play in Croker, they just tell them. Yeah, maybe the players all love playing in Croker the weekend. They probably did. Like, it's pretty they cool. They did, definitely, yeah. Yeah, they absolutely did. But it does lads. make a difference. You can play a different football in Crow Park, like, you know. It well, suits them. Lads, Big stuff. lads at this time of year, that is... That's all they want. Gold boy to be able to play in Croker. Yeah. You'll yeah. see the conditions of some of the pitches, and then you get to go to Croker. It's like I know this yeah. is my shadow. I like I, whatever GA media charity games are happening in the future. I'll bring my boots. I want to play in Crow Park. That's I'm putting it right. there now. I've given up on everything. <laughs> I don't know it's for you, Tommy. I don't know if you have the legs for Croker anymore. <laughs> ah, no, but you well, seven aside thing, is it? I'll or? prove you wrong. I'll prove you wrong. <laughs> well, Colin Collins has him as a wing forward, like up and down. <laughs> no, you're, you're Two GPS is one on the front, one in the back. <laughs> he hasn't given up my legs yet. <laughs> so yeah, there was a yeah. semi finals this weekend. Um, in Connacht, Turla Strand of Sligo, Bet St. Mary's of Leitrim, laid on eight points at six. Very low scoring game. Maybe they should have played that one in Croker too. Very low scoring game also out west between Moy Cullen of Galway and Strokestown. I think it was six apiece at the end of full time. Classic. Mike Cullen winning an extra time. Sean Kelly um, scoring a big goal on extra time. Peter Cook having a big hand in it as well. 2-8 to 7 points against Strokestown. So the Connacht club final will be Turla Strand of Sligo against Mike Cullen of Galway. Um, Don Canellan coaching Mike Cullen and, and doing very well this year. So that's that. And in Leinster, we have Kilmico Croaks against the Downs. Ratote and the Downs. That was a cracking game of football. Not sure how much of this you saw, but um, the Downs edging this one by a point. Ratote had a poor second half, left it very late, dragged themselves back into it and missed a late free to bring that game to extra time. But they won 212 to 17 points. And Kilma Cro- Croaks bet Port Ireland in a leash by 112 to 4. They fairly swatted them aside. So we might come back to that game in a little while with our special guest today. Jason Sherlock is joining us on the Football Pod this week. Just yeah. announced as part of Desi Dolan's backroom team in Westmead. He'll be their performance coach for 2023. So very exciting appointment in Westmead. It's all looking up in Westmead at the minute. Talchon Cup winners, obviously. Um, Desi Dolan now in charge, taking over after Jack Cooney. So, Paddy, Jason Sherlock was somebody who was... You Did you play with J.O. before he retired? You would have. Yeah, I did play with J.O. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I got the end of J.O. Uh, what was I the end of J.O. Well. like? Um, it, was, it was a tough time for Dublin. We were... It wasn't the Dublin team that, that, that I would have finished up with. It, it was pretty heavy defeats to uh, to Tyrone in 2008, uh, to Kerry in 2009. And I think J.O. J. O. and Kieran Wheeler were probably gone after that. I think 09 might have been their last involvement. J.O. will confirm it now. But uh, obviously a legend of, of, of Dublin GAA. Um, great fella around. He joined our team, our group, in 2015 as, as a forwards coach and, uh, and had a massive impact on on our success over, over those couple of years after that. But uh, no, J.O.L., he's local, 
very good golfer, would have been, walked many fairways with him as well. Um, and it's interesting now, he's obviously linked with a lot of um, a lot of positions, obviously heavily linked with the Monaghan gig only a month or two ago, so you might touch on that. But for Westmead, for him going in there, you know, it's, an ex- it's exciting times for Westmead. We had Ray Canella on, the buzz they got off winning uh, winning the Talton Cup, they'd be strong favourites to the kind of steamroll Division 3. You're, you're looking at um, Desi Dolan, one of their greatest, probably arguably their greatest ever player going in as coach. And then someone like J.O. with his experience, I think he'll have a massive impact on those teams. Because you have to remember, we were at some of the games, Tommy, in the Leinster Championship over the last couple of years that, that was made and have lost, and they haven't been clinical up front. Mm. They've left big opportunities behind against Kildare both times. And J.O. would have had a massive impact on our double team around that clinical edge and, and key forwards getting the ball in the right positions and, and, and nailing our shots. Um, and if Westmead had that for the last couple of years, it could be a very different story for them. So be interested to see what he thinks about it. Um, it's great to have him on. Yeah. Yeah. Like that'll be one of the interesting parts of this conversation. The role of a performance coach. Like yeah, carry, carry a, <laughs> yeah, carry a Tony Griffin involved and um the Mike Quirk podcast is back on the OTP podcast network at the minute. And he caught up with Tony Griffin for an hour long chat there about a week ago. You'll find it by searching for it. Very interesting. I'd say a performance coach probably varies from squad to squad and coach to coach. It depends on what exactly the team needs, but the broad um, the broad brief being that you're there to get the very best out of the players on and off the pitch. So is that Was that Tony Griffin's title with Kerry? Performance, performance coach. coach. Yeah. yeah. yeah he, came in, he spoke to Dublin a couple of years ago. Brilliant guy, anyone who's ever... Have you come across him, Jimmy, before? Never. No, game, never yeah. had any dealing with him. A, a talk to us. Actually came in when I worked at Davy as well. He came in and spoke... Uh, today because he kind of does a bit of corporate stuff as well just around kind of just not specifically about playing Gaelic football or playing hurling obviously his background just about kind of your outlook your mentality and things like that and he was fascinating a really great guy so mm. um, I, I would imagine and Jay will tell us himself Jay obviously has a bit more of a background in Gaelic football and what his brief, I'm sure he's had had long conversations with Desi Dolan, what his brief will be. But if you're a Westmead player, the, you know, Ray Canel a couple of weeks ago said the atmosphere around, that I've seen they've enjoyed their holiday <laughs> down in <Yes>. Mexico. But <laughs> to go in there now with the boost they've had of, of winning a competition this year, Desi Dolan as the coach and then someone at the profile of Jail, and even though he's a dub, um, I think that's exciting times for Westmead, yeah. Yeah, you know, in terms of like, say someone, someone like like Jo coming from the Dublin setup, even the most basic thing that he can offer the West Mead group, it might be the simplest thing that Dublin mention every single night and take for granted. Yeah, could transform someone, yeah. someone else. Do you know, like the knowledge that he has, the the experience of success, the way of delivering it to players and getting the respect from players, he might just have a couple of nuggets that will will change their their results completely and even if it is that conversion piece where we're saying I remember saying earlier in the year you're only as good as your conversion rate if you're brilliant on kickouts brilliant on tackling turnovers and next thing you're getting the ball and you're kicking it wide from the wrong areas then you're a bad team you know your, your whole game is going to rely on your conversion rate we, if you can we, fix we, that for them we've seen it Jimmy in the, in the two games they lost to Calder in the Leicester Championship last couple of years they had massive opportunities I remember actually chatting to Desi Dolan not summer just gone, but summer before in Croker at that game, and they had a couple of massive goal chances, and they just took the wrong option, and Claire ended up scraping through. Um, and you can just see the frustration there because Westmead, yeah. uh, from the horse's mouth, Ray Canel, they, they felt they were the second best team in Leinster for a decade, but they probably weren't winning as many games as they should have been in the Leinster Championship, and a key area. And you've seen that the quality forwards they have, the likes of Ronald O'Toole and these guys. Sam McCartan, yeah, yeah, yeah there's there's raw material. Yeah, there. there's something to work with there. Big yeah. Yeah. So so it's interesting, but look, we'll we'll see what what Jo's role might be because performance coach. You're right; it can be very kind of away from the pitch, or it can mm. be very very specifically on pitch stuff. So yeah, interesting to see uh, what he can share with us tonight. Yeah, that'll be really really interesting. So. We're going to get to Jason Sherlock now in the next couple of moments. Later on in the podcast, lads, we might get stuck into, well, we will get stuck into a chat about Michael Murphy. We'll get J.O. on, we keep J.O. for maybe 20, 30 minutes and we'll we'll chat then about Murphy. So I want to get your thoughts on what impact this is going to have on Donegal. 
and also the legacy that man left over that decade. I have one Michael Murphy moment that I'd like to share. A couple of weeks after he won the All-Ireland, I got nailed by a shoulder by Michael Murphy in a warm-up for a, a college league game. And that is my claim to fame of Michael Murphy. He you were fast and around, were you? And he just gave you a kick in the holding. I think he gave me a, a hand pass and I flicked it off and he nailed me and I was gone. I was on the floor. So I uh, had a dead leg for about a week, but it was well worth it. So <laughs> that's my claim to fame with Michael Murphy. Um, a little bit later on as well, we might talk about the rumblings in Mayo. Or maybe we won't talk about it. Paddy, you've put a ban on WhatsApp rumors on this podcast. Now they are like reported them. in Don't some like papers. Them. So we'll see whether we'll come to that or not. A couple of other interesting moves this week. Colin McFadden has been appointed over in Sligo as a coach of Tony McEntee. Paddy, this fella was a footballer, possibly underrated as, as well, in terms of what he brought to the table alongside Michael Murphy. You think he was underrated? I, sometimes. I think we forget how good yeah, Colin everyone, McFadden was. Everyone knew Colin McFadden was top class. Three, one of, definitely has one All-Star. Does he have two? Mm, one well, that's a double check. All-Ireland that. winner, an absolute cornerstone of, of that All-Ireland winning team in, in 2012. Um you know, to supplement Murphy, you, you know, we're touching on what impact Murphy leaving Donegal is going to have. That's catastrophic for them. But McFadden, you're kind of thinking, with all the hullabaloo and Donegal and coaches and who's going to take them over, to know someone like him with his knowledge and how he was as a player, shoot over to Sligo was an interesting one. He would have thought Paddy Carr might have tried to bring him in um, because he's a legend up there and I'm sure yeah. young players in Donegal would have appreciated some of the input he had. But look, he's got in with Tony McIntyre, that's it. It's a good appointment. Good addition to Sligo's team as well. James. I remember uh, I remember Jim McGuinness doing an interview one time. I think he might have been might have been finished with Donegal, but he, they were talking about McFadden and he was going through a very bad spell. He was kicking a load of wides and everything. And they were saying, Why didn't you you take him off or take him out? Give him a bit of give him a bit of space, just just give him a bit of a rest. And he was like, No, I didn't didn't want to mess with his mentality at all. He was so important for me. That I wanted him to know at all times that he was my main man. He was staying on, staying in the team, and he was going to come out of that farm with us, not by taking him out. I remember thinking like that is unreal. Like, imagine having that blind faith from a manager. It must give you so. It must give you so much confidence. Quality he had, you know, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, McGinnis knows the crack, and he's looking going. This guy in box office. Yeah, possibly helped as well that McGinnis is his brother-in-law. (laughs) <laughs> is he? No, no, oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm only joking, no, but yeah, he, he is. This yeah. is ruthless enough. I, I, Absolutely. That's where that would have swung too much. An extra box no. of roses for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But no, that's that's I like that. That's a that's a great line from McGinnis there on that in terms of getting back to form. McFadden was inches away from bringing that 2014 All Ireland final to extra time as well. I don't know. Were you still on the pitch, James? At the end of that game, were you the far yeah. side? Were you on the line defending in the last minute when he hits the post? I cleared it off the line. Yeah. You celebrate now. Uh, yeah. It was a, I can't really remember. There was a bit of a goal chance, right? But it didn't really have a shot at goal, did it? I know Kelly made a bit of a save. But... I think it was a punch. McFadden punches it onto the post. A diving punch. Yeah, now we were coasting at that stage. You have to watch it back. All right, lads. <laughs> this is episode 43 of Football Pod. It is brought to you in partnership with AIB. Proud sponsors of the Football Hurling and Camogie All Ireland Club Championships. Check out hashtag the toughest for more. Stay with us in the Football Pod. We're going to be back right after this with Jason Sherlock. You're very welcome back to episode 43 of the Football Pod with Paddy Anders and James O'Donoghue. And we're delighted to welcome our special guest, Jason Sherlock, who's shown us all up here. He's turned up in a suit and tie. How are you, J.O.? I'm good, Tommy. This is how I roll, you know? Yeah, <laughs> good to see you. <laughs> He's been and if home the... all day. He's <laughs> this if... is my Zoom outfit. It only goes from the belly button up. Fantastic. <laughs> and, and is it a coincidence that it's a maroon tie you're wearing? It's a funny thing. I was in work today. We did we had a thing in DCU uh, with 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 uh, an organisation KPMG. So I did have to wear a shirt and tie today. And I was going to change. And I looked in the mirror at the colour of it, and I said, "Ah." Oh, it's actually maroon, so I, I may as well keep it on because I'm sure it'll be a question or two from you lads. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, no, I'd say the people of Westmead are absolutely excited and they'll be delighted to see that too. Paddy Andrews is usually wearing the hoodie with the hood up and the cap on, but uh, it's myself and James today. Jason, we want to get stuck into Westmead in a couple of minutes, but you had a bit of trouble at the weekend in Crow Park. You ended up on the wrong side of the stadium. How did yeah. that happen to a dub? 
Well, I know. Uh, I suppose I, I, I've been lucky. I didn't have to go up that high for the last few years when, when I was involved with Dublin. But yeah, I was asked to do the co-coms on the second game, the, the Kim McCood Park game. And of course, didn't look at the uh, at the text fully. Kind of arrived in good time, watched the second half of the first game, uh, the Downs against Rathout. Then start looking around for um, a commentary area. I couldn't see anything. <laughs> Kind of had a quick glance at the um, at the uh, text, and yeah, I was meant to be in the Cusick stand, so yeah. that was interesting. Probably ran a bit faster than I have um, in a long time, uh, certainly in Crow Park. So uh, got there just in the nick of time. I didn't know there was. Is there commentary in the in the Cusack as well? I thought everything was in the Hoga. No. I don't think the RT guys RT guys knew there was. Um, obviously, it was quite enough there at the weekend, so uh, it was literally just the four of us over in the, the Cusick stand. So, oh, uh, so yeah, no, um, it, it all worked. But yeah, the, like the games themselves, obviously, it was the first game was very exciting. The second game, it it, it had the makings of a really good game, but obviously, Kilmacud had done their homework, and I'm sure uh, from an atmosphere point of view, there was a lot of Kilmacud supporters were were heading across to the south side after half time so uh it's it was it was disappointing because obviously it's great to be able to play in crow park but unfortunately it, it wasn't a good kind of um, spectacle for for the supporters yeah we're we we won't segue back into it but we were talking a bit about the soulless world cup at the minute and croker sometimes uh <laughs> when there isn't that many people around but it's nearly the grounds i suppose or the, the setting as well for club players it, it's fantastic to have that chance um Croaks, in terms of where they're at, the, the first game obviously had given us uh, a bit more excitement with the Downs and Rathout, two very evenly matched teams, you might say, but the Downs definitely deserved that. Um, how do you see that one going in the final, given what Croaks have shown us over the last couple of years? You would imagine Kilmacud would be strong favourites going into it. Um, I think you could could be forgiven for thinking that Kilmacud might have taken their eye off the ball on, on Saturday because they've beaten Nace, who they beat in the Leinster final. They've obviously ambitions to go the full way, but it was far from the case. Like they, they really set out their stall, they'd done their homework. Um, Port Darling had, had a game plan, but Kilmacud knew exactly how to stifle it, both defensively, but also more impressively offensively. I think they talked about that in the post match stuff about how they were, they were wanted to take a lot of time and be very methodical so listen they, they have all the tools they have all the attributes to be very competitive in saying that even in Dublin and in the, the NACE game they, they kind of have a tendency of keep teams in the game and um, they don't really kind of um, put teams away and um, so in that sense I think whoever they're playing will feel they have a chance but at the same time they just look as if they've got answers everywhere in the pitch so they will take a lot of beating uh, in the rest of the competition. They're yeah. different. They're different level physically, even to to what I've seen. They're just sharper, faster, more athletic. Even like, and they've goals in them. They've goal. They could. They'll get goal chances in every game. They'll probably get a couple of goal chances every game. If that clicks, they're just going to win it. I don't think there's anything. There's anything going to come out of Munster. You've Karen Zarahlis and Clan Mel. They're I don't old. think they'll be as strong as yeah. as a Kill McCod or a Glen or a Kilku. Do you know, so I think if Kilmacud come out of Leinster, they have a right chance to get right back there. Like. I at the nail in the head, myself and Jay have <laughs> suffered at the hands of Kilmacud Crokes for, for many, many years. They're just a really efficient team. That Their backs are solid. They don't give anything away cheap. I remember we spoke about the Dublin Championship final against the FINA, where they probably weren't at their best, but you just always felt their experience... And then they've Shane Walsh. They have an X factor there as well. And, and obviously they're kind of hoping they can get through this game against the Downs and get into post-Christmas where they might get Paul Mannion back. That's kind of touch and go with his injury. But he gives them another factor. If he comes back and they're at that stage of the championship, you would probably have them as favourites. But they're just, they're, you're exactly right. They're fast, they're strong, they're well, well coached. And if they need to go to find another gear, they've been able to do that. And that's the beauty of having a player like Shane Walsh. But yeah, it, you, you'll see they will be favourites against the Downs as well. And they're, they're probably yeah, not, the most, they're they're not the most exciting team to watch, perhaps, but, but they're just really effective at what they do. They have experience. And we were saying, Jay, I'd say there's probably eight or nine of those guys that have all been involved in Dublin squads. They might be standout you know, Johnny Coopers or, or guys like that, James McCarthy's, but they've been involved in Dublin panels. They've all played underage with Dublin. They're all at a really high level for a club team. 
and they're, they're very, very difficult to play against. And you, you could just see that again on Saturday night. It was kind of a vintage Croaks performance. Yeah, we'll be keeping yeah. an eye on Croaks over the next little while. Jason, might, we might move on to the news just before the weekend that uh, it was, I think it was released by Westmead GA that you're going to be involved with Desi Dolan's backroom team. We've had Ray Canellan on the pod over the last couple of weeks. There's a real buzz around Westmead football at the minute. It was exciting seeing the young talents come to the fore and flourish during the Talchon Cup. Could you fill us in a little bit on on how the role came about and what the role a performance coach will be? Because Paddy was talking to us a little bit about the role that you had on the Dublin team as a coach and selector from 15 to, to 19. So how do you see the role going with Westmead? Yeah, well, I suppose like like all these things, it's it, it's great to be kind of sounded out. And I suppose it started with, with Desi Dolan and myself having a, a, a few chats and um I think if you look at where Westmead are in terms of the, the performances over the last few years, they've had a great manager in Jack Cooney, who is now um, employed by GA, and obviously he's looking at pathways. So he's done a lot of work there. In terms of the team themselves, they've had a bit of success. And um, obviously you mentioned their, their success last year. They now have Desi managing. He he His right-hand man is going to be John Keane, another exceptional player, a very dedicated and committed guy. So I suppose just getting to know the guys and just listening to where they are and what they want to achieve, it, it was interesting to me. Um, I haven't been involved in, in, in football in any kind of significant way since I finished up with, with the lads in 2019 so I probably was kind of I was interested and I, I was exploring kind of areas or uh, places that I might or teams that I might get involved in and this just seemed a, a really good fit from for, from both sides Um, in terms of what the role is good question Um, <laughs> what's performance and um, I think um, and I'll go back thinking about my, my first interaction with Paddy when I got the role with Dublin. <laughs> I, I won't tell the story. This Paddy might go on. on. <laughs> go on, so, go yeah. for it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'll, I'll leave Paddy to tell you that one. But I, the, the one thing I said to Paddy at, at that stage was that I'd like to think I can make you a better footballer. And I think as a coach, that's all you can do. That's all you can strive to try and do. And you do that in a number of ways. I think first, you have to be there for your players. You have to build that relationship and trust. And then secondly, you have to try and see where you can add value. If that's technically, if that's tactically, if that's helping the guy with confidence, if that's kind of, if that's confronting and challenging the player, you know, that's what you want to do. So uh, I suppose that's what I'm looking forward to doing, getting to know the, the, the Westmead players and obviously trying to help Desi and his, his backroom team as they progress over the next year. That's very interesting. We, we had obviously Ray Canel as one of the higher profile players in the West Mead team. He came on a couple of weeks ago and we couldn't get over the infectiousness <laughs> of him. There's a real buzz and an atmosphere and I'm sure you, you might have seen that the Talton Cup celebrations, we were at the game and you could see the reaction on the pitch of the players, the supporters. The celebrations they had back in Westmead. You've just missed out on a trip to Mexico. You should have signed on a couple of weeks ago. You could have got down to Cancun with them as well. But but uh, uh, he was the buzz. You, you could you could just get the sense that it's an exciting time for Westmead. They, they Jack Cooley obviously did an incredible job with them, and you get the idea that Desi Dolan, I'd say, arguably their best ever player, is going in as their coach. Or if you're a young player in that team, or, or not even a young player for any player in that team, you're mad to impress. John Keane as well, a brilliant defender for Westmead. And someone like you, Jay, are coming in with your profile and experience, obviously, being in our group as well. It does seem like a really exciting time for Westmead. And, and that's the sense we're getting from the players and, and the, the conversations are immediate view as well. So I can see the appeal of that, that role. And the big thing, the surprising thing, they're in Division 3 next year. And you're thinking that they have the quality... They, they're a better team than that, you would feel, from the outside looking in. So th there's raw materials to work with, but there's also there's like key progress to be made there as well, you feel. Yeah, well, a couple of things, that, that, as you say that, I think they've had success and obviously massive, yeah. massive thing for the, the county and well celebrated. But I suppose the challenge is, is, is that it? Is that is that the height of their ambitions? Are they happy with that or are they willing to, to do what it takes to ensure that there's more success? So ultimately, only players can answer that. And again, I'll be interested to see how committed, how motivated they are for that. When it comes to Division 3, as you guys know, it's a dogfight. You know, and every every county at this stage, whatever division they're in, are all kind of pinpointing the league. We need to have a good league and that. So as much as on paper you would see like Westmead could do well, 
like no matter what the vision it is there's no guarantee so again that's part of the challenge and when you add that on top of i suppose the shortened season and the uh, the additional matches obviously westmead have guaranteed those extra ma ma matches from their performances last year i suppose that has to be factored in then in terms of the the performance and i suppose um how realistic it is to be ready on match day one in the league versus the last game of the all ireland series but again it's an exciting time it's a, it's a great it's a great place to be and i suppose that's part of the motivation why i want to get involved to kind of uh, experience kind of a team that have these challenges and obviously looking forward to, to getting involved. You mentioned that 2019 with Dublin was the last time you were involved in inter-county football. You said back in September that you had strongly considered an approach from Monaghan to get involved as um, the head coach there after replacing Seamus McEnany. Can you fill us in a little bit about why that swang the way it did in that you didn't pursue that approach perhaps? Um, and in, in the same interview, I think you said you don't have a burning desire to be an inter-county manager. Why, what is your ambition or what do you love about being involved in inter-county football as a coach? Um, well, again, to work with players, work with players and, and try to improve them. That's that's the key. That's the key part of why any coach, I suppose, is involved in sport. And yeah, maybe maybe I was I was blessed. Some 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 would say burdened having to deal with your man here and uh, trying to, to <laughs> try to squeeze the orange. But um, but team. no. <laughs> what you say? The dream team, Joe. The dream, the dream team is right. Um, but no, it, it was great, and it was like it was a privilege to work with. In my in my eyes, one of the the best kind of teams and, and panels that have ever to play the sport. But again, it doesn't lose you. Whatever context or whatever level you're you're coaching at doesn't leave you. And I'm just kind of keen to explore that. Um, as I mentioned about Monaghan, again, they they sounded me out. And I like you start with why? Why would you get involved? And there were a lot of reasons why I felt Monaghan might might have been a good fit for for myself. And it was a journey I kind of explored and went went a good bit down that road but for, for whatever reasons just things didn't fit and they didn't work out and um you know I I, I was really appreciative of Monaghan kind of giving me the opportunity to 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 consider the role and be considered for the role and I'm delighted now with having Vinnie Corey having Dermot and, and a few other guys Marty involved as well they're good Monaghan men uh, something that I was keen to have as well involved so uh obviously I'd be hoping that they 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 do well in the year ahead so as, as I said this year is the kind of the first year that I've been open to kind of get involved in a significant way um it, okay. as I said it is 2019 since I was that involved you kind of lose touch you, you 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 like even after 2019 we knew if we were going back in 2020 what we did that year wouldn't be good enough you know we would have been ripping up the script anyway so here i am a few years down the road so i'll have to upskill and, and kind of try to get up to speed to where things are so looking forward to that as well yeah just yeah, think, jail or sorry Tommy, just general, in terms what? of your coaching jail right how far kind of or what's your approach to it are you kind of breaking the individual player down to a kind of a down to the individual break him down build up his skills individually or are you kind of looking at it as more of a a team approach to attacking or your forwards coach with Dublin was it kind of a team approach to attacking or were you trying to develop skills wise and get the individual better yeah probably good question James and probably Paddy would be better to answer because he'd be more qualified he was on the receiving end but like again I don't know you, you just have to kind of understand the context and we're lucky we're all lucky that we've played um played for inter-county and we, we've had some good experiences so you'd like to think you can bring that and apply if you were the player now you can apply that to how you might improve a player both individually but also and probably more importantly collectively and like I think that was a big a big kind of strength and attribute that the Dublin lads had was that there was no one bigger than the team they were willing to sacrifice and be selfless for the team and I suppose that has to be thrown into the mix when it comes to coaching but no James I think like if you look at the components the technical the tactical the physical and the psychological components the, like the first three there are incremental gains you can have you know by being committed, understanding the game, getting into the best condition you can. I think there are little gains you can have. I think the psychological piece, though, between the years, I think is where the greatest opportunity is. And like for a lot of us, it takes us a long time to understand 
the, the value and at the and levels of improvement between the years. Like you talk about the Croaks game at the weekend. Look at Rory O'Carroll. Look at Craig Diaz. You know, physically, they're probably on the on the other side of their of their peak performance but mentally they're just in a much better position than they were five ten years ago and you can see that in their performance so i suppose as a coach it's trying to understand where the player is is it the young book or is it the guy the more experienced guy and where is the improvement going to come from mm -hmm. i suppose sometimes when you have the younger player almost the, the less mental baggage he has or the less thinking about it he does nearly the better because you know, you're going to make wreck when you hit 30. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All you knew was psychological <laughs> stuff at that, at that stage. But uh, no, even like I'd say for Jay's being very modest there, like the, the role would also think if you're a forwards coach is it's, it's really a dual role. You, you are trying to, as Jay said, make your players better. Uh, and some guys might need more technical stuff. Some people might need more psychological stuff. But the individual connection you have with, with, with the players you're coaching is massive. But then there is also the role to the team that it's what's our attacking strategy going to be? What's our attacking philosophy going to be? So you need to, the, the skills are, skills pay the bills, as we say, you need to have your attackers on the money. And that was a massive thing that we would have focused on. But then you also have to have a unit, you need to play as a unit, you need to play for the team. You need to figure out solutions to the, the, the challenges your opposition are going to give you as well. And, that's a key role that, that, that Jason and, and our group would, would have looked at big time. You, you know, you, you have to cover both those bases. You can't just focus on the individual and not think of the wider group. And you can't just focus on the wider group either and leave the individual skills off as well. You have to marry the two of them. And that's what the best coaches do. You prove the player and then you prove the team as well. Do you know what tactically he had with the dubs, especially I remember. And I, you know nothing about tactics, Jimmy. I no. always think that if, if you can get this, I uh, tactically right up there. No, if you can <laughs> kick, right? If Jose. you can get a kick pass to the half forward line, you're you're playing straight away. If you see yeah. a lot of teams, they're too cautious with the ball, say between their own 45 and halfway. And if you can't get your half forward line on the ball quick, then it, it, you're cutting out the inside fella then as well. Do you know? I always thought the dubs, you could get that fella on the ball with a kick pass so easily. I don't know, did you practice it all the time or not? But it was just one yeah. tactical thing that he brought that was, it was. Yeah, well, you, you make a good point, James. Though, and like you guys alluded to, a forwards coach. Like, and in this day and age, it's it's offense and defense. You know, because you know when you're starting with a kick out, you have the ball. That's where it starts. If a defender turns the ball over and we have possession, that's when the offense starts. Yeah. It's not good enough to kind of upskill your six forwards because, as you say, if you don't have the supply at the right time in the right areas you're, you're at nothing anyway so um so yeah like I, I think from from our perspective back with with the dubs the lads the the inside lads appreciated what the the, the kind of guys further down the pitch were were able to provide in terms of service and I suppose the flip to that was lads like Paddy had to work a bit harder up in the corner when we didn't have the ball you know and that was the that was the little bit term. <laughs> We see it in all the games. We've said this. You looked at the all the final, the, the biggest game of last year. There, there's times where you see Kerry have 14 guys behind the ball and, and David Clifford, fair enough, is, is probably allowed uh, a little bit more leeway to stay up. But that's just the nature of modern game of football. That wherever you are on the pitch, you're involved in a defensive play. You, you, you see guys, you see Sean O'Shea back in his half-back line one of the best forwards in the game. That's just the nature of modern football. You have to tick those boxes along the way. The, the old days of, you know, we Bernard Brogan, very good teammate of both of ours, he'd be trying to apply the David Clifford side of things. I'm going to stay in and keep fresh. You can't really get away with that anymore. And you see it, uh, the best teams, you have to be able to do that side of the game as well. And it's it's been a big change probably over the last decade. But um, if you're not at that, you're going to be up against it at the business end of the championship, definitely. Gail, yeah, last one. Um, Pat Gilroy is obviously back in with the dubs at the minute as well. Did you have any way of knowing back in 1995 that so many of your teammates in that dressing room were going to be involved a coaching or selectors or in different ways in inter-county football over the next 20, 25 years? Like Jim Galvin, Desi Farrell, Pat Gilroy, Jason Sherlock, Mick Galvin, Paul Clark, Mick Deegan, Paul Beelan, Jack Shady, John O'Leary, <laughs> Paul Curran's been involved in, in management plenty of levels as well. There's others too, I'm sure. Paul Curran's like the Robbie Keane of management. Like. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so like, 
there, uh, there hasn't been a proper study done on the amount of uh, the correlation between you know All Ireland winning teams in the nineties and the amount of coaches afterwards, but that is a very high proportion. Yeah, we'll put it this way: I was never, I was never short of someone to give me advice anyway in the dressing room. That's for sure. And um, I suppose to to their credit, that that was a team of individuals. They a lot of strong characters. Um, so yeah, as it's proved, but like it, it is great, and it is kind of I suppose a legacy of that team that so many individuals have gone on probably on the football pitch probably didn't didn't maximize the opportunities that we had in those years but obviously the fact that these guys are still still involved and they're still well regarded I think is is in some ways a testament to that team as well so uh for poor I probably Pat O'Neill didn't get as much credit as he deserved because you can imagine how uh how, how events some of the, the team yeah. meetings would have been <laughs> there you go <laughs> Did the how, we 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 tried to clarify this earlier? How long did the Paddy Andrews Jason Sherlock axis join for before you retired? Was it a season of the two? Uh, I remember young Pa, young Pa is uh, an aspiring cornerback. Held in the back that time. Held the gooch to two six one day. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't but, uh, bad at the time. <laughs> and then we played actually. I think it was Westmead. Did you? You, you were man of the match uh, against Westmead. And there. as a half forward, no, what was it in the championship? I'm pretty well. Oh, anyway. yeah, Westmead, yeah, 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 yeah. I think we, I think we had a, an evening in the straw hall on the on the back of that as well. So, um, so oh, that was no. the day. all of those days, Joe. Total that, football. That was the day you got your your goal, wasn't it? Your, that that gorgeous goal into the top corner, and you did your celebration, your cantina. I didn't score many of those goals, I must say, unfortunately. But uh, no, we had a couple of years at the end, uh, didn't we, Jay? Yeah, back yeah. and forth. Yep. Jason Sherlock, thank you very much for joining us on the Football Pod this week. Really appreciate it. And very best of luck next season. We'll be keeping a keen eye on Westmead. Cheers. Thanks, lads. Best of luck, Jason. Fair play. That is exciting for Westmead. Now, one point of contention. He didn't spill the beans while he was on air there, but Jason Sherlock did set you up for a little tap in, Paddy. What was your first interaction with Jason Sherlock, the coach? What's the coach? (laughs) Can you remember it? What was he talking about? Vaguely, I think. We were at a... I think this would be it, yeah. We were down at Ross McConnell's wedding, was over in um, was it Loch Rain. So it was out, out there somewhere anyway. And uh, we were obviously on the beer for two days. <laughs> and, uh, I was getting a lift back, had about, I would say, 15 minutes sleep. I was getting a lift back to Dublin the next day. And I was like, fuck, who's going to bring me home? And text Jay, because he lives around the corner for me. You know, Jay, you driving home? And he's like, yeah, 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 I'll pick you up. And uh, so this is the Sunday. Uh, around December time and two and a half hour drive home and me burning the ears off jail and his wife Louise and bananas like and not a word out of him it's like this fucking age would ever shut up like <laughs> drops me off the next night we're back with Dublin this is 2014 going into 2015 to start off like a pre-season meeting and Jim Gavin stands up and goes right we've uh, we a new coach coming into the team this year <laughs> <laughs> The door swings open and J.O. marches up to the front of the room and I'm like, oh my God, what? <laughs> me, the head on me and he's looking at me in the front <laughs> row, smiling away and me uh, put on the beer for two days with him. So yeah, didn't say a word to me in the car on the way home. Never uh, mentioned it. Didn't mention it at all. I was hanging myself. And uh, sure enough, 24 hours later, he walks in. And that is class. And I was like, oh, fuck's sake. <laughs> but no, oh, no. He's, he's a great fella. Yeah. Uh, Team, fortunate enough to play with him. He's obviously a legend of, of Dublin GA, and uh, yeah, yeah, big impact on our on our group now. Yeah, but uh, hung me out there, not a word, <laughs> not a word. To me. I thought you were going to say he dropped you off at Jim Gavin's house again. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't far off. Yeah, it wasn't far off. Yeah, God, the Dubs are good at keeping things under wraps, aren't you? Yeah. No, he, look, he'd be said a word. He'd be a good addition uh, for Westmead, most certainly. If he oh, yeah, hundred percent. That's that's. that's Oh, yeah. that's gonna that's really exciting for all their footballers and their fans this year. Uh, what's not exciting though, Adrian from Donegal, is that the Titanic Michael Murphy at the age of 33. So I think he's older than the two of you. No, no, he's younger than me. He's younger than Paddy. You're younger than me, yeah. Okay. Um, my 28 has retired. You're perennially you 28. back, eh? Hey? I don't know this year or what. Are you gone? Are you? Is he gone? Have we lost? No him? comment. Look, no comment. <laughs> Don't tell me you have to get another replacement. 
Hang on, my internet is gonzo there. Oh, oh just, that's good timing. Yeah, I thought you were going back <laughs> in. Did you say that? That's good timing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus, no, 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 no. My sentence okay. is done. James, can I come to you first on Michael Murphy? You can. Where does he sit for you in that pantheon of great footballers from that time? Because he would have broken in at the age of 17 and about 07. So by the time you've established yourself, Michael Murphy has captained his county to an All-Ireland title um, at yeah. the age of 20. What age was he? 07. So he started in, at 17 years of age. He made his debut. 2012, he captains Donegal to the All-Ireland title at 22. So you have your breakout year the following year. Where was Michael Murphy when you were breaking through in, in your head in terms of the, the great footballers? Well, we, played, we played... Under 21s, we were in the Munster final and we played Donegal in a friendly and he was playing. And that was my first time coming across him. I'd known obviously he was a senior player at the time, but see him up close and personal and to see kind of the the silky skills, yet big size of him and how he combined the two of them. Like, it was so impressive. And they went on and I think they lost the all Ireland final. He missed a penalty, hit the crossbar. It's Dublin, penalty, yeah. I think. In the, the last, in the and last the goal, second, it went back about twenty yards. He hit it that hard. Yeah, it was that. So we played him. Are you playing that year? No, I was the year okay. before. I was Sorry, actually no, remember Sorry. it. Um, Sorry, James, go on. Um, yeah, but so from then, what was interesting about him was that he his rise completely coincided with Donny Gall's rise because of his personalities and his traits. Like he he took on that group as a complete leader. And just brought them to another level. Like if he was just a good player or a good corner forward, would Donegal have won the All Ireland? Probably not. Or would he have had the career he had? No. Like his main thing, as as unbelievably talented as he was, I think his main trait was his leadership, the way he brought fellas along with him, his unselfish forward play, his 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 personality, his aura. He just had this this something extra about him. And then when you add in his unbelievable silky skills, you do have to say. He's definitely one of the best. He's definitely one of the best of his generation, which was, uh, oh, which yeah. is a big compliment. But he, like, just an all around top bloke, I'd say, a great teammate, I'd imagine. And yeah, he'll be, he'll be badly missed. But what I will say is, for the Donegal management, they've definitely missed a trick there because if you're going in, if you're going into to a new job, in any job, you rally the senior players around you. Michael Murphy isn't even a senior player. He is the senior player in, in, in Donegal. He's that important. He's the main man. Go in, put your arm around Michael Murphy. Tell him, tell him not what he needs to hear, but tell him what's true and how important he is. Don't have him retire, you know, within a couple of weeks of you taking the job because it just sets out the wrong message early on for Donegal and it does not bode well for them. You know, to lose Michael Murphy is, is a blow they're not going to recover from this year. You know, there is no doubt about that. And it's it's a bad, bad start for Carr and O'Rourke and Donegal. Yeah. It's uh it's not good. You know, <laughs> like to take <laughs> over, to be going back now, I think you're back 24th of November into county training. I'm sure counties around the country have met up, they've had a meeting or two, they probably maybe set a program in place, maybe had a couple of trial games behind closed doors or do the regional competitions like it's happened to me. But like, that's crushing news. And and Ryan McHugh was speaking last week about it. Um, was 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 brilliant talking about Michael Murphy and what he brought to the place, what he brought to the dressing room, what he brought as a man, never mind as a as a footballer. What a loss! Oh, it's it's catastrophic for Donny Alley. Like that that is the reality of it. He as we talk about players who are so important to a team, bar maybe Clifford with Kerry, I don't think of one player who is as important to their group and to their county as Michael Murphy for over over a decade. Uh, I was fortunate enough to play with him in, in DCU for a year, even at that time. He's just an outstanding player. And then Jimmy, I, I agree with you, Jimmy. All the skill, all the talent in the world, but his leadership from a young age was incredible. To, to basically, Trent Donegal were, along with Jim McGuinness, they were nowhere, really. Like, and to bring them on and, and to win win the All Ireland, obviously they, they got one multiple All Star championships, multiple All Stars. He's had an outstanding, I'd say, Tony God's best ever player. 
total respect from everyone across the country. A horrible person to play against. <laughs> with Dublin, we had some obviously titanic battles with him and his Donegal team, but I, I agree. If you're going in there as the new coach at Donegal, I mean, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth priority is to make sure you have that man on side because he, he is that important. Um, and even, even at his age, and look, we always, always say that such a personal decision when you step away and he's his obviously busy personal life, his professional uh, life as well. But you're thinking, get a couple of years out of him on the square. You know, he's that's always the great debate about playing out the field or playing in. He was yeah. that good. He could be, he was one of the best players in the country in multiple positions. That shows the talent he had. But if you're thinking, if you're a Donegal supporter or if you're Paddy Carr and they're thinking, give us a couple of years on the square and he'd be absolutely devastating there as well. So it's it's a massive blow to Donegal, to the new management team. But, but for Michael Murphy, I would always say he does not owe anyone anything. He's been outstanding for, for Donegal and for GAA as a whole. A brilliant guy, a brilliant player uh, and has the respect of the entire country um, Absolutely. for, for what, what, he, what he's done and what he's done over the last decade. Yeah. Now, when you say he's 33 years of age, right? And I know he's been back home. I know he's been working in the university, Bo, but I think he's the yeah. head of sport up there. He's got his own sport and leisure shop, Michael Murphy Sport, which sponsors the club championship. There was a story last week that Michael Murphy's been man of the match in the Michael Murphy championship <laughs> a couple of years in a row. Oh, like the, this with, is like the Guitar World Cup stuff. Sensational. <laughs> <laughs> I'll present but, the man of the match award to myself. <laughs> I know, so I know he's been Very, back in. Probably deserve the model plans. Really. Probably getting a voucher for it. But what I'm saying is, like those years under McGuinness, mm. and Jim says it, the only fallings out they ever had was over injuries. Where Michael would let on, he's captain. He's not able to be injured. He was never injured under Jim McGuinness. He didn't miss many matches at all. They were the only fallings out they had. They were tough trainings under McGuinness. I'm sure all of them were around the country. But the trek from Donegal to Dublin, from Dublin to Donegal when those boys were in DCU and there was a there was a good class of them. There was Michael Murphy, there was Martin McElhenney, there was Marty Boyle, there was Anton McFadden. I'm probably forgetting a few boys here now Michael as well. Boyle. Michael Boyle, what did I say, Marty? Marty Boyle. Won't Michael Boyle, cracking, cracking goalkeeper. So there was a there was a good clatter of them. Great lads, great yeah. lads, great crack all together, I must say. And that was a long car journey back. A lot, a lot of the time throughout the year. So it is, it is. that has to have an impact on the body as well. So when you're looking at a 33 year old Michael Murphy, maybe it's there's a little bit more in the legs. That's what that's what I was thinking. Like, uh, do you know, you, you can spin it both ways. Has he mm. gone out kind of close enough to the top where he's saved all his dignity and you know respect, lauded, still a great player, or do you spin it? He's gone. He's gone a bit too soon. Do you know, like I. I think he does have probably more to offer in terms of the football side, but maybe it was just a case of in terms of mentally, professionally, everything. He was just, he'd had enough. But when you see him, you do think this fella still has it. That's the, just kind of going to be the sad thing. I was almost expecting to be seeing Michael Murphy taped up to the nines you know, <laughs> at the age of about 34. <laughs> doing, doing a Pierce Morgan interview with his phone. I don't think that's Murphy. We know the crack. It's 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 a personal decision. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Finally, yes. you sit down, and I'm sure he has thought about this. His family are engrossed in Donegal GA. Absolutely. Uh, we had a similar scenario with Alan Brogan on our side in 2015. His last act was was kicking an iconic point in the All Ireland final against you guys, Jimmy, and then he retired a couple of weeks later. And you're like, what? Oh, this fella could do another two or three years. But it's just whatever people have gone in outside with their work, with their family life. And just like he doesn't owe anyone anything. He was playing for Donegal at 17. Do you know what I mean? It's not like 33 may say, geez, he's a couple more years. But the mileage he's put on the clock, yeah, and, and the service he's given to Donegal. The, the only thing you'd say, you're looking back, he's won in All Ireland, which is incredible as captain. They've only won it twice in their history. They'll regret, I feel they that that team probably didn't win as much as they probably should have, particularly in the Ulster Championship. You look at them on paper, we always say Donegal on paper. Five Ulster Championships. That's and they only bad. had they only had five in their history before that. They had one All Ireland bad. and but five Ulster titles before Michael Murphy. And they one All Ireland and five after. 
they could have had another three or four of them and maybe had another tilt at an All Ireland. But Kerry robbed them in fourteen. But if you if you look what? at what <laughs> Jimmy, you've your one as well. But but now like it's no coincidence that Donegal's most fruitful period in their history, he has been the absolute forefront of it. So yeah. look at he's well on as you can see the reaction on, on social media and across all, all platforms over the last week or so for him. So he's for myself, guy. personally, we yeah. wish him all, all the best with it. Um, sad not to see him out there again, but um, but what a player, what yeah, an absolute great guy and a brilliant player. You got a year with him, right? In in DC, yeah. Paul, Paul Flynn, um, lives they in live him. together, last yeah. yeah. So I, I had a year now, I was four floors down, so all I already picked up after my leg. Penthouse suite, <laughs> yeah, they were up at the top, so um, but, in DCU, yeah. but Flynn, Flynn talks about um just how they used to sneak out in between lectures and just practice kicking together and how Murphy, he credits Murphy with taking on his football and ability on that little more. He says they both learned stuff off each other, but I think he credits Murphy with that that bit of... Um, the boys were tight now, yeah. They were putting down as one of the best ball strikers he's ever seen in the GA, but um, yeah. Flynn, yeah, Flynn pulled out an outside the right there, didn't he, towards the second half of his career? In 14, like outrageous against Donegal that year, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. was a good influence on him, definitely. Yeah, a hundred percent. Last one. I have a text from Jason Sherlock. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Push Paddy on that story. I said, "Don't worry, we have." He said he wouldn't remember <laughs> what he said. I said, "I can only imagine what was said in that car journey." He wouldn't remember, and you left one bit out, Paddy. I left him <laughs> off at a pub to go on a session with the Bridget's lads after it. He was quite <laughs> cheap when he saw me two days uh, later. You know, I think I went home. I think I went home. <laughs> okay, lads, I've enjoyed it this week. <laughs> Thanks very much for joining us once more on the football pod and to everyone at home for listening in. Great to have you along. Um, we've had a couple of great interviews over the last couple of weeks. We're going to be back next week again. So do subscribe to the football pod. James is, O'Donoghue. Is, is it a season week. finale next next week? It is a season finale, boys, for oh, 2022. Okay. So, okay. Paddy, it's our second season together. Yeah. Yeah, racking the book there. We put in a lot of hours. Fifty pods this year. I'm telling you, buddy. And James, <laughs> <laughs> James, uh, first year's already done. Up. Please give me a heads up if Jack O'Connor is on to you because I don't know if I could deal with replacing another pundit this this winter. Oh, Jimmy, this morning. I'm going to, I'm going to his performance coach. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're the tactic. You're the brains of that operation, Jimmy. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Kick All to right, the half forward line, another all iron in the bag. Have That's a great the week. Only thing you know is from the dogs. <laughs> He used to kick it to the half forward line. Oh, no, I always say kick the 10 and 12 and you'll... Uh, it helped if we had Conley and Flitter as our half forwards there. They're two good lads to kick to now, but uh, yeah. yeah. It makes a difference though. Yeah. Go on, let's just watch the World Cup. Very good, boys. Appreciate it. Talk soon. Thank you. See you lads. Good night.